Today's Center Reviews Nation podcast was brought to you by Manscaped. Head to manscaped.com and use the promo code capital C, capital L, Nation, and to receive 20% off plus free delivery on all their products. Welcome to this podcast of Center Nation. This is Pat LaRusso, soon be joined by my co-host Anthony Sino, Lucas Ugenti, and our brand new teammate, uh, Blair Barton. We'll be looking at the upcoming season for the Maple Leafs and so much more. So welcome to the latest podcast of Sensation. Uh, this is your host, Pat LaRusso. Um, I have my co-host that you're very familiar with, uh, Lucas Genti and Anthony Sino. Um, but before we start off in our, in our latest podcast for 2021, I do want uh, to introduce our brand new co-host and uh, contributor to the blog, Blair Barton. Blair, welcome to the team. Thanks, Pat. Uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> well, Blair, you know what? Kind of let uh, some of our listeners know, you know, kind of a little bit about your fandom and, you know, maybe what they can expect uh, from some of your upcoming blogs. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, super excited to, to be with you guys and work on this. Like I uh, have, I have been following you and, and Pat, I've known you for about 16 years. So, uh, you know, this is this has been great. Uh, I'm working with you the last few weeks, kind of getting ready to to preview the season. So, um, as far as uh, writing goes, I mean, I'm a I'm an old old school kind of guy. Like uh, you know, Pat Quinn teams and uh, you know Gary Roberts and Darcy Tucker and, and that kind of stuff. So. Um, you know, I just, I, I like to see a good, great balanced, uh, team and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking towards for the kind of new era of, of the Maple Leafs as well, although it's not the rough and, and tumbly one. It's, uh, it's a great team and, um, great organization and, uh, just happy to be able to talk about it with you guys. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so, you know, that kind of really takes us into, you know, our first blog for 2021. Um, where, you know, I, it was kind of like a season preview. I love doing these because, you know, the, the starting of the year training camp and, and all that is there's all this hope and excitement. Um, you know, they haven't played any games. Um, there's nothing really to bitch or complain about yet. Um, but um, I did pose oh, a couple of... Ah, come on. You know there's always going to be something from from yeah. our uh, from this fan base. Come on. That is that is true, and you know, seeing that some people are complaining about the corporate logos and why Scotia Bank's logo on the white helmet isn't blue, and oh you know what, God. it it you was. See it. I, you know, I, I, I guess <laughs> I'm the, the one person that, that can't can afford to lose money are the banks, right? So, it, <laughs> it, if anything, we should be happy that the money is going back into our sport, and and you know, the players will have access to all the things that you know. That, that they're able to have and I think it's fantastic that they're that they're finding a new way and it's tasteful it, it doesn't look bad I no it. no it doesn't it doesn't take too much away um so I'm gonna pose this first question to you all and then we'll kind of take turns you you know but maybe you can go first and then we'll go Anthony and then Lucas um but I one of the biggest questions coming into this season and, and we saw a little bit or actually a lot of it last year was this like Dr. Jekyll Mr. Hyde um, complex from this roster. Um, but, but what do you think about the changes made in the offseason and how do you think that that will impact, you know, some of the inconsistency in play that we saw last season? Well, I think, I think you just said it. Um, you know, it's a great question because what they have in some of these players are, you know, known consistent players, right? Uh, Joe Thornton, uh, you know, is there anybody better in, in our era for consistency? I mean, this guy is just a tank year in and year out. And you know, last year he made a couple of pylons look fantastic at center. I, I think, you know, he can, he can do well here. And, you know, even though he doesn't have a cup, he definitely has a, a championship and, uh, you know, on, on the Olympic stage and uh, he's a winner. And uh, I think that's going to go a long way, even at 41 years old. Uh, Wayne Simmons, you know, uh, I know he's a little beaten up now, but he's going to bring it night in, night out. And, you know, that's going to be a key missing element to, um, you know, a sustained playoff run, I think. Um, TJ Brody, and, and you know, he, he, he played great with Jared Dano for, 
for years. And uh, I think that that's just the kind of stable, gifted player that will complement Riley. And uh, I mean, we can keep going on, but I, I think what they've done is is really complement some of the new with, with with some of the old around. And, and maybe these players aren't what they once were, but uh, you know, Bogosian, uh, you know, I, I think I think these are all great things for this team. I think they did a wonderful job. Excellent. Uh, Anthony, what were your thoughts on, you know, how the changes might impact, you know, some of the inconsistency that, you know, the, the three of us last year was like a common thread in our podcast of like, what could take this team to the next level? Yeah, I think, I think to, to echo what Blair said about Joe Thornton, I, it, it's really, uh, to me, it's someone that comes in um, and just kind of brings that makes it fun to go to the rink again because this team clearly was not having fun last year. They went through a ton of turmoil you have, and it, and we, we talked about it, right? It's as, how many times have we talked about where it's like, we just don't know how this team can fall flat on a, on a night and they're not recognizing the moment. I think out of a, any player in the past, maybe 20 years, who doesn't recognize the moment more than Joe Thornton? Because the guy seems like the, like the best guy to go have a beer with, but when he's on the ice, he's as competitive as hell and he just brings it right. He's averaged over 51 points, I think over the last three seasons. And we, I don't even think we've talked about this yet. I know uh, it has been mentioned in some blogs, but he's being paired with the two cornerstone players of the franchise and Marner and Matthews on that line. Now, I don't think that's going to be like a line that's written in stone for the whole year, but I just think it's something that it's just going to rejuvenate those guys because at the end of the day, those guys are going to be the one that has to drive the bus for this team to be successful. But overall, I think if I had to choose one word, it would be accountability. They're bringing, they're bringing that accountability back into the dressing room. Last year, it was kind of, I think they just, they handed the keys over to, Marner and Matthews and Nylander and Riley too early and it was just kind of their dressing room and they're like okay here you go and clearly there was a, a, a disconnect with them and the coach and Babcock and that set that team back over the first 23 games like I don't even remember what their record was but when the by the time they fired Babcock maybe you guys can uh, jump in here but I don't think they were nine, in a playoff spot. 9-10 and 2 or something okay. nine. Ten yeah, nine, ten, and two, or nine, ten, and three, or yeah. something like that. It was bad, yeah. right? They were out of a they yeah. were out of a playoff spot, um, and and I just think that it, it just it, the, those guys were not ready to like claim the locker room and just be like, okay, guys, like if some if they weren't going that night, like who is going to step up? Who is going to hold the Matthews and the Marners accountable if they weren't going? And I think Thornton and Simmons and Bogosian bring that, and then again. Uh, on top, another important thing that I said Kyle Dubas needed to do in the offseason, and I wrote about it, is TJ Brody. Like uh, like Blair said, he's the best partner that Morgan Riley's ever had in his NHL career. Bar none, no questions asked. I think Riley's going to be – he's healthy now. I think he's going to have a great season. And Brody brings that consistency. The other older veterans bring that accountability. I, I really like the moves, and I'm really excited to see how it turns out. Excellent. And Lucas? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny. First of all, I, I just want to say that I think Ron Hainsey was the best defensive partner that Morgan Riley ever had. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I guess I'm that's pretty sure he had Matt Hunwick. So oh, then, didn't, didn't he have that's, that's, for enough for a bit too? When, when he was, was first, I believe the order, yeah, goes, f- the order goes the order goes and then for a couple times it was like uh, Gardner Ryan for O'Burn. a bit too. Ryan O'Byrne and Jake Gardner was like missed. Yeah. Gardner for very few games. Yeah, and it went to Matt Hunwick, mm. then Ron Hainsey, or sorry, then Matt Hunwick, Zaitsev. then Nikita Zaitsev, then <laughs> Ron Hainsey, and then last year Cody CC. So, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's close. So it's close between CC and Hainsey for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but you know, yeah. As for uh, the question was posed, how how do they fix their their inconsistency, Pat? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, you know what? I, I guess I would say it's obvious that the moves Dubas made and the, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs team made will help with consistency. You know, they got a couple um, playoff experience players in uh, Thornton and uh, Simmons, but just won a cup. 
So it, it's, it's obvious that he, they made the right moves that will help with consistency. But I think truthfully, the biggest thing is, is the team as a whole. Um, and I think the core players had to go through what they've been going through. Um, I, I know it's kind of the same thing and it sounds like we're beating the, a dead horse here when you're saying, ah, they lost, but it's a learning experience, but it, it truly is. It truly is a learning experience. Um, the core of this team is extremely young. Um, I know they're getting up there in age now, uh, hockey terms, prime. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you got to lose before you know how to win. And this team has so much talent and so much potential. And I think they're doing a really good job meshing the past with the present. Um, I, I think that just going through the hardships and all the turmoil that happened last season will make them kind of similar to what Anthony says, will make them appreciate the game more, appreciate this team more, appreciate Sheldon Keith more, and maybe, maybe play, play for each other, play a little bit harder throughout the year. Um, and on, on those days where skill clearly doesn't have it. And, and, you know, the, the top six really don't have it. That bottom six can step up. Guys like Simmons can, can start playing a little cheap, a little dirty, a little, uh, chippy and and things will change the tide will change you know the four check will be a little bit harder teams won't have it as easy to come out and start a breakout um there's so many things changed with the acquisitions but i i genuinely do believe that another year another year older um all of that contributes to how to fix consistency and you know what anthony you actually sparked or just sorry. sparked an idea sorry sorry, sorry. Um, sorry. yeah so you you actually mentioned about having fun and if you go back to that first year that the Neiland that Marner, Nylander, and Matthews came up in the NHL, that was one team that had fun. They were laughing, they were joking. Um, you could see that they enjoyed coming, you know, coming to the rink every night and playing. Um, they showed, <laughs> right? Like they had they, they didn't know better. So they were having fun. So I mm -hmm. think if if what Joe Thornton might bring is almost that, that time machine. Or maybe it can get these guys back to reminding them what it was like to come back into the league and just enjoy playing. Because I know with Babcock, there were some things that were happening in the locker room. You know, you could clearly see it on their faces, especially starting last season, that they just weren't happy. They weren't enjoying it. They, you know, they, they kind of played in spurts when they, they, they kind of wanted to. You started to see it shift when Sheldon Keith came back or when Sheldon Keith got hired on. You know, like just inserting Spezza like right off the bat and, you know, having fun with the guys again. And you saw the change. So, you know, I think one full season with Keith, you know, Joe Thornton is known for his California attitude of just having fun and keeping the dressing room light. I think that'll go a long way uh, to, you know, helping because, you know what, I know in my job when I'm having fun is when I'm doing my best. So, you know, if that's, if, that's, if that's even the one element that Joe Thornton can bring outside of his on-ice production, you know, sign me up, you know, because I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think, I think, Pat, what you said there, just to jump in on, on the having fun one more time, and, and I just thought of this now with Joe Thornton, is I think what makes Joe such a, like, a lovable guy, like you see in the, in the scrimmage, right? They're, they're having just a complete blast. It's a blue and white scrimmage. They just score one goal, and Joe's hooting and hollering, right? I think what Joe realized a, a, a quite a few years ago, I would say maybe five, six years ago, just before San Jose made their, their cup run, I believe in 2016, where they lost to Pittsburgh, is I think Joe realized, look, it's hard to win in this league. At the very least, aside from giving it my all every day, I'm just going to go and make my teammates – have the best possible experience when they're at the rink. And I think that, that, that was lost, like you said. And, and to tie that into what Lucas said about them playing for each other, I think that what, what uh, Jumbo is going to bring is, will go a long way in that. How many times last year, and I, and I remember a few instances, is where one of their players, their, one of their guys gets hit hard or maybe it's a little cheap shot from the opponent and there's no snarl back. Now, I'm not asking Austin Matthews to drop the gloves and fight. I don't want him to. But I want him to at least go and tell that guy where to go or do something because not for anything other than it shows that, like, you care. That's, that's a teammate of mine. I care that you tried to, like, hurt him, right? We go back to the bubble. Jason Spetz is the one that has to drop the gloves and fight to spark that uh, crazy comeback, I believe, in game four, right? So it's just it was little things like that last year that I think the new additions can can help avoid those help putting the Leafs 
in those bad situations and they can just remain more consistent through the regular season. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that Joe um, really brings to the table, and, and he, there's two sides to him um, from, from what you hear. Um, obviously, the fun-loving guy, he, he keeps it fun. Um, the, the other intangible that he, he does bring, other than obvious you know, world-class skill, is um, he takes his, his training very seriously, and, and he's, he refuses to stay off the ice on, on game day. He always takes a game day skate. Um, that's, that's one thing that, that, uh, he never, which is tough. You know, you kind of want to manage his time on ice uh, that he doesn't need to be there. So obviously eliminating the game day escape for a 41 year old Joe Sorge wouldn't be the worst thing, but uh, he, he loves to get out there and he, and he, and he is having fun every day and you can see him out there just stick handling and everything. And, and just his t-shirt and his gloves and, and, uh, you know, reminding these guys to get up and, you know, hone your craft a little bit, have some fun with it, you know, have a couple coffees head to the head to the rink joke around with the boys and go home and have a nap get ready for the game but um just all these little things i think that he that he adds is uh you know just it's just a win no most definitely that actually plays really well into the second question that i posed and you know it's kind of funny when we think of inconsistency one of the biggest things that we saw with last year's team more specifically is when the team faced adversity when their backs were up against the wall nine times out of ten they buckled. It seemed as if, you know what, they, they mailed it in the, the last 20 minutes, 40 minutes of the game, and they were done. Like, you could just tell they just weren't working. So I, I would kind of like to get your view on, you know, and, and it could just be an extension of the consistency issue that we saw and, and you know, how some of these new players and some of the, the incumbents might come about, you know, over overcoming those. But I also want to get your thoughts on how do you think this team, in, especially in a condensed schedule that, that they're going to be facing, how can they overcome their uh, overcome adversity? Because a lot of it does come from confidence, and and I kind of want to get your thoughts on, you know, maybe what it, what it what it might be like in that dressing room if they do lose a couple games in a row. You know, does it does it snowball and does it impact the rest of the season, or you know, or or is there going to be some pushback? And Lucas, I kind of want to get your thoughts on this first, and then we'll go Blair and then Anthony. Well, oh yeah, I mean, I think kind of coincides with what I was saying earlier, just in, in, in terms of experience in general and, and, you know, already battling through the demons and turmoil of last season, obviously they gained experience on that and they know how to go th or push through certain aspects of, of tough parts of the season. But uh, truth, truthfully, I also do believe that the, the certain turmoil the team faced last year will be different than what they're going to face this year. I can't foresee them having a coaching issue. I think the, the actual locker room, um, culture is different. I think that obviously the addition of Joe Thornton and these guys do change the culture in the change room. And, and I just think that the team itself this year has a, a complete different vibe. And I know it's a funny word to, to use in this, in this case, but it, there really is. It's a different vibe. It's a different feel. It's, there aren't as many question marks on the actual roster as it is, as there was last year in the sense where we're guys like Yonta going to take the next step. What's happening going to take the next step. Obviously they didn't did per se, depends who you ask and what time you ask them at. But I, I mean, I, I just think that, this roster is so different from last year's roster. Um, they have the ability to overcome, uh, like I was explaining earlier, the, the certain turmoils that could, they could face this season, especially with the guys like Simmons and Bogosian. You know, like Anthony mentioned, uh, guys getting plastered into the boards and no one doing anything about it. I highly doubt Wayne Simmons is going to let Austin Matthews get hit into the boards awkwardly. Things like that are going to change, and it changes the culture. It changes the atmosphere of the team. Um, and I just think that they will play for each other this year. And because, that, because the team will be a lot closer and, and they will want to play for each other, that the adversities that they will face, you know, they might, they might defeat it easier. They might defeat it a little bit uh, with less of a challenge because they are so close together as a team um, and playing for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Most definitely. And but sort of what are your thoughts on, you know, this team's ability now with the new roster, new makeup, um, you know, in their ability to overcome adversity? Well, I, I think like uh, Lucas summed it up uh, pretty well. I think, you know, they, they lose consistency. They lose focus. Uh, it, it feels like that, you know, they're so kind of offensively driven that, that it's, it's almost like a video game to them. And then, and then when things get serious, it's um, they lack that battle mentality that you need to close out a game and to close out a series. And uh, it, when things don't go their way, you know, you don't, you don't see them finding ways to win. Right. And, and that's, that's what it comes down to these big games. It's, it's just, the, it's the lack of focus and, and uh, you know, looking for that highlight 
And when sometimes they just need to make a play or make a hit or, or hold the puck in the corner, like, you know, like Hyman will do, but there's not enough of that on this team. And, you know, with, with you know, adding Bogosian and, and Wayne Simmons, um, certainly will will bring some more of that. And, and, you know, they have so much talent that with some of these character things that they've done, I think they've addressed it. And I, and I think that the team will be more consistent and maybe it might take some time to gel, just get to, used to each other. But I think in the playoffs, you might see a little bit more jam and a little bit more willingness to respect the outcome of the game rather than your own play. Most definitely. And Anthony, what are your thoughts on, you know, battling adversity and, you know, how that could impact the season? Oh, we lost. It seems like we've lost Anthony. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, oh, I was oh, on, no, I was on mute. Oh, no, I perfect. Mute, <laughs> first yeah. mute, mal mute malfunction of the season. Way to go, one. rookie. Is, you, know what, you know what? Do we, do we let this one go because it's our first podcast of 2021, or are we going to just constantly bring this up now for the next just, few? Oh, just you, get it out of the way. Guys missed, you, guys missed, <laughs> you guys missed out on a, on a very great transition there. I was talking for there, a good 10 seconds on mute. There, there was a couple, <laughs> hot, there was a couple of hot takes we had on there. That, uh, yeah. Oh, geez, we, yeah. Missed, we missed Anthony's hot takes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay, sorry. So nonetheless, uh, for myself, I think it's about attitude, right? So for me, if that's that, uh, built, beating adversity is about the attitude that you bring each and every day. Um, I'll, I'll go back again to that, to that comeback in the bubble in Toronto. You cannot, you cannot bank on going down 3 nothing in an elimination game and making that type of comeback every time. That's adversity. Like to me, those are one in a million flukes. And I hate to bring it up. Like they least lose four one when they're up with 10 minutes left. Like I'm, I, I, I hate beating a dead horse, but like, I don't think that ever happens. And you play that game 10 times. I don't think they lose that game another nine times out of 10. Right. So with me, I think that it's just an attitude that you bring every day to talk about a recent discussion in the hockey world where, uh, team Canada in the world junior uh, in the world junior tournament before the gold medal game everyone's uh, praising this team they're going to be uh, known as one of the best t uh, team Canada's to ever go to the world juniors ever uh, and then Trevor Zegris on the on the American team comes out and says this team has not been tested yet this tournament well what do you know Canada doesn't score in the first five minutes like they did the first six games of the tournament USA gets out to a quick lead and they shut down a Canadian team. And, and now people are saying, oh, well, this team just didn't battle adversity and they just weren't ready for the gold medal game. I, I'm, I don't believe in that completely because I don't believe in, in going down in a game big just so you can try and face adversity. If that, I don't know what the word for it is, but I don't believe in adversity for the sake of adversity. I think it has to do with the consistent attitude that you bring that for when that time comes, because you know, it will come throughout the season. It's, it's just, you've been there before you have that calming presence in the room and say, Hey guys, get back to the basics here, play our game and it will, and it will come. N the best team's not always going to win every night, but if I was Sheldon Keefe, I would tell these guys this before they start playing, they play Montreal on Wednesday. There's six teams that are standing in this team's way, to be only eight games away from a Stanley Cup championship. One Canadian team's making it to the conference finals out of this division, guys. All they got to do is beat six teams. Six teams, and that's it. And you're eight games, and you're eight wins away. So I don't see how much more I – don't, I don't know how you can get more motivated than that, just, just based off that sentiment alone, right? So you got, that's what the message needs to be in this room, is that the talent's there, the opportunity's there, now it's just about executing it, and it sounds cliche, but like now, now's the time. There's no Most excuses of this team, this roster is young, anything like that. I think this is the time where these young guns need to just firmly take grasp of the city and this fan base and say, okay, enough's enough. Yeah, it's, you know, we, when we, we kind of saw this with the 93 team, you know, they were the underdog, and then they kind of went on this run, you know, like as much as fans in Toronto are really looking at this league team saying, you know, they're much improved. They should win the division. There are a lot of people outside of Toronto and some local beat writers that just, that could 
all that have also written articles about how they see the Leafs possibly uh, missing the playoffs. So, you know, there's enough adversity and there should be enough pride in knowing that, you know, you could essentially win the Canadian title, you know, by winning the division this year. It'll never happen again. So, you know, it, it's definitely an honor and it's definitely a challenge. And, you know, I, I'm looking at a team that has so much more to give. And, you know, we were disappointed last summer. I thought there was an opportunity for them to go on a little bit of a run. Call me the, the um, you know, the eternal optimist. But um, I, 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 I definitely see this team. There's a definite different element. They are a lot more mature with the likes of Simmons, Bogosian, and Thornton. So, you know, it does. And one other thing that we, none of us actually touched on, but I did kind of cover it in the blog, is what, what I think is going to help this team overcome both of those major questions is the depth. There is now competition for every role on that team if your name's not Austin Matthews, William Elander, John Tavares, or Mitch Marner. Every other position on this team is up, is up for grabs. Zach Kaiman, you're starting the year on third line. You want to get back to playing with Tavares and, and, and Nylander? Play better. You know, I, I think that that level of accountability and that internal competition will bring the best out of the players this season. And I don't see it on too many of the other rosters um, as we look at the Canadian division as a whole. On, on, that, on that note, as far as Hyman goes, I, I actually don't mind the move of moving him down. I mean, he played terrific last year. Um, I, I think some of the, the biggest question mark going into the year might be third line center. Um, you know, Thornton's not playing there. We, we kind of penciled him in there throughout the summer. I think a lot of us did anyway. Um, yeah. But, you know, is Kerfoot going to be able to support that role? I mean, you know, that's a tough trade for the, for Kadri. I think Kadri was fantastic in that role, obviously, with the mishaps in the playoffs. But, um, you know, Kerfoot has a lot to prove. And, and I think Zach Hyman is, is there to make him better. Uh, that, that's that's how I think that Keith sees it anyway. He thinks a little bit outside the box. And and I, and I think Hyman will, will bring something to that line that will really add balance to it, right? No, most definitely. And that actually leads into, you know, Lucas, your blog that went live tonight. Um, you know, do you want to share with our listeners just some of it? And, uh, you know, we'll kind of offer up some of our opinions as well. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I'd love to get your guys' opinions on it because um, basically my blog was just written about the roster moves that happened today um, and a little bit about the taxi squad. And my, my initial thought was there really wasn't anything too surprising on the cuts. Um, I'm obviously not going to go through the list of all the guys, but there really was only one that I, I looked at and was like, Oh, I, I, you know, I didn't really expect that. And I don't want to get too much into it without uh, talking about the blog because I'd rather you guys go and read it. But uh, basically what I said was, you know, Pierre Engvall was a bit of a surprising cut. And I put that in quotations because obviously he's not cut cut as in see you later. We'll never see you again, but I, I didn't necessarily expect it to, to happen uh, mostly because of the contract, he contract extension that he signed last year. Um, you just don't really see that. You don't see a guy really sign an extension. Not that it was for a boatload of money, but 1.25 million in a, a cap strapped team. It, it kind of, <laughs> kind of is. Um, and to see him just, just be cut on opening day on the first uh, initial roster cuts was, was a little bit surprising. Um, well, sorry, sorry, Blair, you wanted to say something? Well, yeah, just, uh, you know, I, I, I found the move a bit odd and he hasn't played great, um, but you know, this is a, what, six foot four uh, pound, forward that can play at all three positions um, at an NHL level. Um, he isn't going to be a Maple Leaf tomorrow if, if there's, uh, you know, 30 other teams that have a chance at him. Yeah, and that, that was a kind of the surprising thing. I'm not I'm not too sure. Does he, does he go through waivers? Is that? Uh, he does. He doesn't, okay. He doesn't, right, yeah. So he goes to the Marley. Yeah, right, right, right. So, oh, okay. I thought he was – I thought he was able to be he, – he, He's uh, – he's, I believe the – I'll confirm the amount of games, but I think – so – uh, just a quick housekeeping rule on that because he was still waiver eligible the NHL actually changed the amount of games you need to play this season because it's a shortened season okay. um, in order to become waiver eligible so I think once Engvall plays seven more NHL games I believe the correct number is then he will then have or then he will have to go through waivers sorry so I think move. this is a little I think this is a little bit of strategic move and I yeah. I don't mean to hop in on that but I think the main reason is guys is that um they're and if you notice they're they ha they didn't uh send Aaron Dell through waivers today their third string goalie 
I think what the plan is, and you also notice if you saw the news today, that Dermot is now going to be playing on the bottom pair with Bogosian as opposed to Lettinen. Uh, another trick roster manipulation there is Lettinen doesn't need waivers. So I, what I think the Leafs are doing here is they're sending all the guys that don't need waivers to the taxi squad, the Lettinen, the Sandine, uh, the Engvall, uh, and those guys. And they're going to keep Dell on the main roster as the third goalie keep no extra skaters and they're just going to go with a 21 man roster with the Aaron Dell as the third goalie. And then they're going to try and maybe sneak him in through waivers uh, later in the week or maybe next week, because I think right now, if you send Aaron Dell through waivers, a team that needs a goalie like New Jersey, who just lost Corey Crawford to retire retirement, they would claim him. So I think there's a little bit of a, uh, some jockeying there for Dubas. Yeah, there's a little bit of yeah. jockeying there. They're trying to be smart with it. They're trying to be cute with it. Because ultimately, what's the difference between German and Lettinen in the opening night lineup, right? So I think they're just trying to keep that third goalie strong. Uh, because the boogeyman, Michael Hutchinson, is fourth on the depth chart. So if you lose Aaron Dell, <laughs> yeah, you're in some you know, trouble. We know who's, we, we're in trouble. So hey, I watched Michael Hutchinson shut out the Vancouver Canucks, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never forget that. I watched that live. When, when you when you were playing NHL 21? That was the greatest day of my life. <laughs> no, it's uh, – and my, my biggest shock was was Letton going down. But, Anthony, you do make a good point about, uh, you know, Dubas and the Leafs really leveraging and being creative with the taxi squad. Because I thought he had a really good um, scrimmage game, blue and white game. You know, he put the puck on net. Um, he got – he picked up a couple of assists. Um, he didn't really look out of place, mind you, you are playing an inner squad game, so I know it's going to be different once the regular season takes off. But I thought he played sound. Like, he he didn't and, – and I, and I always bring this up, and I, and I heard this quote, and I forget who it was that said it, but the quote was, if you see a defenseman, he's having a shitty game. That, mm-hmm. you know, a really good defenseman is one that you don't see. Um, and I, I just thought he played a really quiet game, and I, I like to see, you know, what – you know, how the, the year transpires for him. And also with Bar- Barabanov, I thought he did really, you know, he did a really commendable job on that fourth line. So, you know, I think those will be um, some, I, I think at the time for a lot of people, they were unknowns and they were underappreciated signings. But it, I, I think that they offer this team some additional depth that I don't think a lot of people really appreciate at this moment and flexibility with the roster. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. Right, that we we know that we know that they're going to get creative with it, right? So and they have to. Pre- yeah, they they have to, right? I think they're with the current roster that they have, right? With their four lines, the uh, forwards, their three D pairs, and the three goalies. I think they got five hundred thousand dollars under the cap, right? So obviously, yeah. to get, I think so. Who whoever went on waivers today, I believe, was Adam Brooks. Um, Travis Boyd, Callie Rosen, and I think Kenny Augustino. So there, those are obviously guys that we envision on the taxi squad. Those were the kind of the guys that were on the taxi squad in the bubble as well. So hopefully all of them get cleared. I believe there was 89 players that went through waivers today. So good chance they do, right? Like, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of players to go through waivers on one day. So maybe it was just a gentleman's agreement through the GMs to just get everyone through today. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, they're, they're going to get creative. That $500,000 cap space on opening day, that can accrue uh, throughout the year, right? So don't forget about that. The amount, If you save about $8,000 per day, right, because $500,000 on the cap divided by however many days in the season, um, I believe I read in The Athletic that if they can keep that type of cap space throughout the year, uh, you would have about $3.3 million in cap space by the time the trade deadline is there. And that, and that could lead to an addition for the yeah. team. Right. So, and that, and we all like the sound of that. So definitely some, some smart moves here by Dubas. Like th- that's something that we can trust from Dubas, right? Like w- w- that, that's an assumption that, that uh, this podcast likes to make. Not every fan likes to make it because they just have a, an insane bias against him. But that's something that I'm always comfortable with. He always knows how to run his cap. Yeah, it does help when you have Brandon Printham, you know, sitting right next to you, you know, juggling the cap and knowing how to not necessarily circumvent it, but 
be creative within the guidelines. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. um, that definitely does help. Um, but before we wrap up this latest podcast uh, on the year, um, I do want to get one final prediction from each and every one of you, and then we'll we'll kind of close it out for uh, for this latest podcast. But I want to I want to get your prediction. Where do the Leafs finish in the All Canadian Division? Uh, Anthony, we'll start with you. It's, it's first. I, I it's first in the division. Um, yes, I think I think Anderson's going to be a huge part in that. That's something that we actually didn't even talk about in the season preview. Probably the most important player that needs to make a jump this year is, is Anderson, right? Uh, but we'll, we'll we'll save that for another day. Let's just leave that up to mystery on Wednesday. I, I, I really think he's going to have a bounce back year. Goalies are a little bit voodoo like that. I think he's going to get a lot of break, a lot of rest this year. So he's going to be a lot healthier. The defense improved too. Better D, yeah. It, yeah, the D improved. The The forwards are still good. Um. And I don't think they, uh, I don't think any Canadian team is just good at each position uh, as much as the Leafs. So uh, I'm going to predict first place for them. Excellent. Blair, your prediction for the Leafs in the Canadian division? Well, every year at the beginning of the season, that it's, it's, you know, it's normally fall and to get that all, you know, that feeling you get on opening <laughs> night. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm approaching them with, uh, you know, optimism cautiously. Um, but Hey, I've been telling myself almost my entire life that heading into every single season that they're going to win the cup. So um, uh, they're coming in on top, and, uh, and you know we're going to be socially distanced down Young Street in the <laughs> summer. Excellent. And Lucas, finally, what are your thoughts on where the Leafs finish in the All Canadian Division? Like, why do I always have to be the devil's advocate? It just seems like it all, <laughs> always pans out this way. But listen, you I, got it written. You got it written on your forehead, Luke. Serious, it's, all, it's my nameplate. Nobody just told you. It's my nameplate, <laughs> devil's advocate. No, but listen, I'm going to be completely honest, and I think this is a pretty fair assessment. Do I think they're going to finish first? Obviously, I'm a Leaf fan, and I do think that this roster is unbelievable. But there is a part of me, there's a part of me that just truly believes everybody plays harder against the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I believe that too. I think, see, so maybe I'm not the only one. I, I just think that <laughs> Montreal, Ottawa, they're going to come at Toronto so hard. Every single time they play, there's going to be so many overtime games. I just, I just have this feeling that Toronto's going to make the playoffs. That, that is never going to waver. Whether it's first or second, I don't know. It, it's going to depend on how many games they win in overtime in a shootout because I just truly believe that a lot of these teams are going to fight as if it is a game seven every time they play the Maple Leafs. And that just comes with the territory of being the Toronto Maple Leafs. And if it wasn't an all Canadian division where you see these team, te- these teams 10 times, it maybe would be a different take, but man, Toronto versus Montreal 10 times. I don't know. Who do you, who do you got first, Lucas? I, uh, this might, you know, this might be a little crazy, but I really like Calgary. I, I think Calgary's team is so good. I think uh, they finally have a attendee. Um, and if their offense gets going and Goudreau goes gets back to where he should be, I think that team's really good. Yeah, that's kind of where I, I that's kind of where I sit is, you know, if it's not Toronto, then it's Calgary. And I just when I look at the rest of the teams, like Edmonton's got no goaltending, large questions on defense. Montreal, yes, they up their defense, and yes, they have Carey Price in net, but they can't score. And the NHL has proven time and time again you need to have that balance. And without scoring, it's it's eventually going to catch up to you. Um, Ottawa's rebuilding. They might surprise. I like a lot of what all of Ottawa has done on the short term and long term. Um, I think we're going to see the Battle of Ontario back really strong in the next couple of years. But, you know, I think Ottawa is going to just be there. I'm on the fence with Vancouver. Um, I think Vancouver took some big strides last year. But once again, I think they lost on the back end. And I, I'm, I'm not sure about their goaltending, but I guess we'll see with Demko. Um, but no, I, I, I have the Leafs as number one. If I'm going to have a number two or if it's going to flip, it's going to be Calgary, Toronto. That's, those are the two teams I'm going to watch the rest of the season. Um, so, gentlemen, this has been fun. Blair, welcome to your first um, podcast and hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, great time. Thank you, guys. And to all of our listeners, um, you know, continue to look out for us every Tuesday on Spotify and everywhere else where you listen to your favorite podcasts. Um, as well, you're going to be seeing some major changes with the Center of East Nation blog. Uh, we'll be launching a brand new site. Uh, we're hoping 
by middle of February. Look for all the major announcements on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. Thank you guys again, and we'll do this all next week. Cheers. Take care, guys. Take care, guys. Appreciate Cheers. it. Take care, guys.